There are only four questions of value in this life. Said Don Juan DeMarco through the voice of Johnny Depp, which I cannot do. <laughs> what is sacred? Of what is the spirit made? What is worth living for? And what is worth dying for? These are the very same questions to which the scriptures of the world's religions offer an often detailed response. And it is in these very details that we are often divided and sometimes even lost. With all of the world's religions originating from different contexts of culture and history, offering a different path to answer these questions, there are those, maybe even some of you, who struggle with the question, there are so many choices. How could I possibly choose between them? There are those who find the scriptures of the world's religions to be contradictory in their details and who use these contradictions between texts to claim that the scripture that they support must be the only correct one. And there are those who use those same contradictions to claim that none of the texts have any value at all. And there are others who refuse to engage with anything outside of the scripture that was given to them in their family or that is most present in their culture, choosing to turn a blind eye to the diversity of the global experience of the holy, choosing to turn a blind eye to what is sacred in this world. Two stories in my own history come to mind specifically when I thought about this sermon. The first is about a friend of mine who was talking to her father about her father's experience of parenting her. Maybe you've had the opportunity to be in a conversation like this, adult to adult with your own parent. It can serve as an opportunity to connect and to heal, and it can also be a complete disaster. At one point in their conversation, the conversation took a turn towards the more vulnerable, and my friend spoke of some of the choices that her father had made in his parenting decisions and how those choices had had a negative impact on her life. Now, obviously, this was difficult for him to hear and to take in, and for whatever reason, he responded quite flippantly, well, it's too bad there's no manual on how to raise a child. Now, my friend has a child of her own now, and that was actually one of the motivations for her even wanting to have this conversation with her father in the first place, to learn from his mistakes, what he would do differently, what the reasoning was behind some of those choices that he had made. His response was frustrating to her on multiple levels, and he was not willing to or could not yet recognize her struggle. He was not seeming to take ownership of the difficulties that they had had. So my friend's response to her father's comment was, Well, Dad, actually, there are probably over 5,000 books that have been written on parenting and child rearing. She stopped there, but to me, she said, Couldn't he have at least read one of them? The other story that I want to share with you this morning is a little embarrassing. I used to have this terrible habit of picking apart other people's certainty about their religion, even to the detriment of our relationship. It was a while ago, and I've learned that this is not how I choose to be. But I was working with a man who I general, genuinely liked, and yet I could not understand how this very intelligent man could be so literal, so fundamentalist in his Christian beliefs. It just did not add up to me. So for a while, I think he found the dialogue between us interesting and a challenge, so he engaged, until my questions started to dig at him. 
a bit. I must at the, admit that at the time I found this kind of amusing. I would say things like, did you ever notice that they called Jesus Jesus of Nazareth when he was really born in Bethlehem? <laughs> I remember very clearly the last time we talked about religion. Our last conversation before it became an off-limits topic in order for us to maintain our working relationship. One day, he told me that the reason why he was a Christian was that he used to work in a neonatal intensive care unit. And he would see all of these newborn babies in various stages of health and disease. And he said, I could see in all of their eyes the light of God. Now, remember this was back then, I wasn't as nice. I remember having several thoughts at the same time about why this wouldn't necessarily make him a Christian, per se. Maybe it would make him a theist, but it wasn't, it was just his context that made him a Christian. If he had had that same experience at a neonatal intensive care unit in India, it might have made him a Hindu. Anyway, I was feeling particularly feisty, and instead of finding the place where we both agreed, that common ground of revering the miracle of life, of celebrating the awe of a new life, I said. But in your understanding of Christianity, don't you believe that all children are born into sin? So those children couldn't have had the light of God in their eyes yet, right? Now, my jaw dropped open when instead of disagreeing with me, and much to his own defeat, he said, no, you're right. I must have been mistaken. Instead of allowing his direct experience of wonder and awe to hold significance against this contradiction to him in theology, he gave all of his power, all of his experience away to one interpretation of the text. It was so sad to me. And I could tell that he was sad too. Essentially, because of what was written and so narrowly interpreted, he not only denied his own experience, but he was claiming to believe in a God who was actually less compassionate than he was. That God is way too small for me. You see, what is held sacred in our culture is sometimes placed high up on a shelf and protected from discernment. It's secured against violation and infringement, immune from scrutiny because it just is that way. When scripture is held sacred in that way, we lose the psychological truths that are embedded in its core we lose the spirit of the text as a whole that, because we're buried in the particulars. When scripture is sacred in this manner, we lose that which speaks to the human experience and that which holds up to individual scrutiny and reflection. 